Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us tonight at live stream at the Upper Room. We are glad that you're joining us. And as we wait for more people to, to log on tonight, uh, we'll, we'll just keep going. We're glad that you're here tonight. And I'm very excited about the guest that I have on tonight, Pastor David Rosales, founding pastor and senior pastor at Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley in Southern California, and uh, a wonderful man. And we're going to go in depth with him in just a few minutes. But just before we do, I just want to let you know, uh, if you want to learn more about The Upper Room, go to our website at theupperroompresents.com. That's theupperroompresents.com. You'll learn about what we're doing there and uh, and a little bit more about who we are and, and so forth. Um, also, let me see what else I have. Oh, if you haven't liked us on Facebook, please do so. And also tell your friends that may not be on Facebook that we simulcast this broadcast on YouTube. Both can be found at The Upper Room Presents. And you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, or you could uh, just like or follow us at The Upper Room on Facebook, and you'll be notified when we go live. So those are the things I wanted to get out of the way, and we want to get right into our our guest tonight. You know, one of the things that uh, I'm doing right now is we're doing a series on certain Calvary Chapel pastors. And these are pastors that I that I have admired and respected for years. Uh, my beginnings were in Calvary Chapel in 1976. I went forward at a concert and dedicated my life to Christ. And uh, it, at uh, one point, I was on staff at Calvary Chapel of Whittier as a as a youth pastor back way back in the 70s. And, uh, but these gentlemen I have uh, admired for many, many years. And, and those that are, that are in this series, and we've already uh, done uh, an interview with uh, Raul Reese of uh, Cap Calvary Chapel um, uh, Gold Golden Springs. And then we did, um, we did, Bar uh, not Barry Stagner, we did uh, last week, we did uh, Skip, um, <laughs> Skip Isaac. Okay, it's senior moment there. And uh, ones coming up are going to be uh, Joe Foch, Calvary Chapel of uh, Philadelphia. And actually, Joe and I go way back to Calvary Chapel of Whittier when he was there. Uh, Mike McIntosh, Barry Stagner, uh, Jack Hibbs, and Greg Laurie. So we're looking at forward to some uh, great interviews ahead, and it's our Calvary Chapel Pastor Series. But I'm not going to waste any more time before we bring our guest in. Would you please welcome... Pastor David Rosales. Hey, David. How you doing, Ron? I'm well, thank you. Good to see you, and thanks for, thanks for being with us tonight. Oh, it's a blessing. I'm, 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 I'm real blessed to be with you. Thank you. Well, thank you, and likewise. You know, we, uh, as I was mentioning to you, I think one of the things that, uh, and and the, the those pastors that I had just mentioned, um, you know, everybody sees you guys all the time. You, you're on. Uh, on live streaming, you're on the radio, uh, people see you at church, but um, I know most of you guys aren't guys that like to talk too much about yourself. And uh, what always intrigues me is the man behind the ministry, the man that God called to, to the ministry, uh, your personal story, your backstory, your upbringing, um, things that made you who you are today. You know, I read, a when I read something, and I'll, I'll read it now, a quote that that you said, because we'll get into this a little bit later, but you said, when I look back on those years, meaning those years that you were in drugs and alcohol and so forth, when I look back at those years, it seems like another lifetime. Uh, that's why today I'm actively involved in the community and trying to reach people where they are, where they are at. The world is full of troubled, tired, and hurt people. God loves them, and so do I. That's what this ministry is all about. We want people to see that God is in the business of changing lives and change lives. He did in yours, didn't he? Amen. He surely did. And yeah, God so, is gracious. He certainly is. Um, but let's, let's start at the beginning. If we could, you, did you grow up or were you born in, in California? And yeah, I was born and raised, born and raised in California, born in um, Whittier, California and grew up in, uh, in Norwalk and remained in Norwalk until, uh, until the mid seventies when I married and then, you know, moved out. But yeah, I was yeah. born and raised in Southern California. Did you? Okay. I grew up right next door to you in Pico Rivera. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and did you come from a religious uh, household at all? Or, Well, I came from a um, religious in the sense of um, 
um, my mom's, my mom had a, a religion that she followed, you know, I'm, I'm Mexican American, you yes. know, and so uh, it's pretty typical for Mexican Americans to be raised in the Catholic yes. faith. And so, so I was raised as a, a Catholic. I got uh, baptized when I was four months old in uh, what is called La Placita Church in, uh, in uh, Alvera Street, very totally. old church there. And yeah. so, Mama took me there to be baptized. I received my uh, uh, first communion and sacrament of confession, and then went on to uh, to my confirmation at the age of thirteen. And so I was raised in a Catholic environment by a mom who had a, a certain devotion, you will say, as a Catholic, but nothing nothing extreme in terms of having to go to church every Sunday and things of that nature. But yeah, my dad, on the other hand, was. Uh, was pretty much not so much an agnostic as somebody who, who simply never thought about what the issues of faith are, and never spoke of God in my entire life. I never heard my father, one time, use the name of God outside of when he was swearing. You know, so <laughs> that's kind of how it was for me. Right. And so I was raised in a, a home with a, uh, with a Catholic mom and a pretty much uh, a non-religious father. Yeah. Was it a loving home? Did you have a good family life? Was it? Uh, I, I think that uh, no, it wasn't a loving home. Uh, in in what we would say today is a model of a loving home with a, a, a father involved and a mother that's yeah. generally kind. No, um, my dad was uninvolved, and uh, it wasn't. He wasn't a real pleasant person. He wasn't a mean one. Yeah, by any means, but he wasn't. He wasn't a vocal person. And not an affectionate man. I, I I think in my entire life, from the time I was as small as I can remember till I was probably in uh, 20 years old, I don't remember my father outside of one time ever saying, I love you. My father was an affectionate. And uh, my mom became ill at a very early age. She was only 24. And she became, uh, she became um, subject to epileptic seizures. Oh. And so when I was four years old, she had her first and uh, they put her on various medications. Uh, and uh, on occasion, she would mix her medication with uh, alcohol and then fly into rages. Oh, and gosh. Yeah. On, on, yeah. on occasion, she could be she could be very abusive. Yeah. So no, I didn't come from a, uh, a Christian home by any means or a, a warm home by any means. Though my mom, when uh, under normal circumstances, was very deeply in love with her children, she when she was on her medications and when she on occasion abused uh, the alcohol, uh, she became everything but. Yeah. Warm. And so that's how I was. You know, that was my environment for many years. Yes. So, how many uh, siblings did you grow up with? I have a, an older brother and two younger sisters, so there were four of us in, yeah. in the home. Yeah. Are those any of your your siblings walking with the Lord now? Or are they? You know, they all they all came to faith in Christ uh, the day I got saved. The day really? I got saved, I came home from uh, from that in the meeting and uh, shared with my sister Madeline, who was uh, four years younger than I, and uh, shared with her what had happened. And uh, she went to bed that night and said, whatever you did to my brother, I want you to do that for me. Is that right? So she got saved the, the same day I did. And my brother, uh, a few years later, and uh, my sister, Rebecca, uh, got saved in 1998 after living uh, as an open lesbian for, for many, many years. Wow. She, she, she gave her heart to Christ. And it's just an amazing transformation that she's gone through. Wow, that's wonderful. So God has swept through your family. Amen. Yeah. Folks, if you're joining us uh, right now, we're speaking with Pastor David Rosales, founding and senior pastor of Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Uh, if you're watching tonight, let us know where you're watching from. And also, we're going to try to take some questions a little bit later. If you have questions for Pastor David, uh, just type them in and we'll try to get to them. Uh, but also let us know where you're at and make some comments about uh, what you're seeing tonight or or your thoughts we'd love to we'd love to hear from you um i know that you did you struggled with some drug and alcohol issues was that um was it in high school or did what with transitioning from your family life uh did did that kind of drive you to a 
party life or a, where, where there's I would say so. I would say so, Ron. You know, when I was small, meaning seven, eight, nine years old, mm -hmm. I, I actually at that point in my life had wanted to uh, to know God. I can tell you that I I had desires to have a knowledge of who God is and all of that kind of thing. But my mom's illnesses were really they were they're real bad. I mean, I would come home. Um, fairly often as a little boy, and we're talking about somebody who first encountered an epileptic seizure at the age of four. Oh my. And so I would come home, you know, uh, at the age of seven or eight from school, nine years old, and it, it went on for years. And on occasion, my mom would be on the ground having a, a seizure. Mm -hmm. And so I learned very early uh, how to take care of her in her condition. And uh, so what I did is... Uh, I started becoming very, very uh, afraid she was going to die. I mean, yeah. um, that's what you do. You think your mother's sure. going to die and all. And so I did. And so I can still remember speaking to my dad because mom was hospitalized on occasions uh, as a youth. And so and I was, again, about nine years, 10 years old. Uh, I, you know, I loved my mom deeply. And so I was crying myself to sleep one night when my father walked in and mom was in the hospital. And so my dad came into my room and you know daddy again was not a real warm man so kind of in a gruff way what's wrong with you you know what are you crying right. about? you right. know and i said i'm um, i'm crying because mama's sick and he said to me well if you are a good boy she won't be sick anymore oh gosh I'll never forget that and so what i did is i i became the model i became the model child you know anything you can do to save your mother well yes so I became the model. I mean, I was a very good little boy. People would say that, and, and it was right. I, I avoided evil. I, I, I did everything I could for uh, a number of years until I was 15. So by the time I got to be 15, my mother was getting worse, not better. And I, and I said, well, you know, this, this being good doesn't work. I've lost already several years of my youth. I, I actually thought that I've already given up plenty of, of fun times I could have had. Um, so that uh, mom gets well. She didn't get well. So at 15, I started abusing alcohol. By the time I was 16, I was entering into marijuana use. And then ultimately, as you know, the psychedelic scene came in in late 60s. And I began to, to experiment on occasion with psilocybin or, or THC or on occasion acid, you know. And um, so that kind of became where I was moving. Yeah. to uh in, until i got saved at 20. wow that's quite a heavy uh thing to put upon your your child when you were nine years old when your dad said that to you right around there yeah yeah and so you you had to tow that line that to, to be the good kid um because you know you believe what your parents tell you when you're nine Absolutely. years old and, and so that that probably had you internalize a lot of things and did you become angry at all did you I did. I did become angry um, when I drank. You'd know that I I had anger issues. Yeah, uh -huh. and but uh, you know, again, you know, from my background, uh, my father being very quiet with his feelings, I, I pretty much naturally was following in that kind of yeah. uh, model, right? So I kept my feelings to myself. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell people how I felt about anything. I didn't show emotion. Uh, as would be natural for any kid. I didn't do that. I bottled all my emotions. Yeah. So uh, is, there's a joke amongst Mexicans, and I'm, being a Mexican, I'll give you the joke. There may be one or two watching, <laughs> especially the guys will know this, that, that the joke is that uh, a Mexican man never shows his emotion until he's drinking. And, <laughs> uh, and, and he'll tell his girlfriend or his wife, he'll say to her, you know, you know, I love you. I love you with all my heart. Yeah, he will. That's when he becomes romantic. But if you ever go out on me, I'll, I'll kill you. I mean, that that is that is kind of a, a truism. I mean, yeah. so that's how I was. I if yeah. I if I was drinking, yeah, I became more open. Uh, but I could also be, become upset yeah. at yeah. the drop of a hat. So yeah, that I internalized all my anger and started showing it then. Yeah, yeah. Um, how has that, is that uh, internalizing of your emotions, did, did that kind of, did you 
bring that into your Christian experience or how has your faith changed you? Well, you know, normally when you get saved, you get saved as you are. Yes. You know, so, you know, what happened is God's sanctifying work by his spirit and, yeah. and his word began to reveal to me um, those things that were not really normal because you think they're normal. Yeah. And so he begins to show me by his word that uh, anger, anger in the way I ex expressed it or was feeling it uh, was not pleasing to him. So what happened is I actually began to be set free as I should be by the spirit and by the word. And so I've shared with my fellowship here before how that, you know, as again, as a man, I, I never held, for example, I never held babies. I mean, that's what women do is how yeah. I, I thought, you know, women hold babies and men kind of look at them you know, and say, well, that's yeah. a nice baby, you know, and, yeah. and that's how I was. That's how my dad was. He never said, I love you, never showed affection. And so I thought that was normal. But then I'm reading the Bible and, and I see how Jesus uh, actually would hold the infants. Right. And, yeah, right. And, and, and I see that and I think it must be normal or right to, to be able to hold an infant. And then I see him weeping at the grave of a, a friend. And, and I say to myself, it must be okay to show emotion at loss. Yeah. And that's what happened, Ron. It was yeah. um, it was uh, being, being instructed by the word of God that taught me that certain things were not only normal, but my savior himself did those things, right? And so yeah. it's through the word of God. And then it came through the conviction of the Holy Spirit where I said, I don't want to be the kind of man I was. I, I don't want to be... I don't want to rely on alcohol to express emotion. I don't want to be bottling my feelings uh, because I don't want to be controlled by others who can use my feelings against me. And I, I, I grew up, I just started growing up in Christ, realizing some very basic things that probably everybody knew except for me at that time. Yeah. And uh, it's through the word of God. And, and then finally, I would say what God used uh, the most in my life was giving me a, a precious wife who just absolutely taught me what love is. And she really yeah. did. And so yeah. all of those things working together. There's my girl right That's there. Your wonderful, Marie, your wonderful yeah. wife. How many years have you, you guys been married now? 45 years next month. 45 years. Wonderful. And how many, there's another nice photo. Yeah. Very beautiful woman. How many, um, how many children and how many grandchildren? We have four, uh, four kids, two boys and two girls. And I've there's got, you. uh, I think we've got 11 grandchildren. That's one good looking family, David. I think it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are any of them in the ministry? Have they followed your foot? Well, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my daughter is my secretary. My daughter, Anna is my yes. secretary. Right. And my, my other daughter, Corinne just retired out of ministry here, 31 years serving as my, uh, as one of our secretaries. My son, David, uh, has been working for us here uh, for 30 years. And my uh, my son, Joseph, served here for a number of years. And now he works for Kaiser. He's a hospital administrator, RN. And so all of them nice. uh, followed in my footsteps in one form or another. Excellent. And they're, and they're all serving the Lord. Yes. Wonderful. Yes, Thank Isn't you. Isn't that a blessing? Yes. Amen. Yes, indeed. Because I know there's a lot of friends that I have that can't say that about their kids and yes Amen. it's a blessing Amen. you know you were talking about emotions and and uh and i was thinking and by the way folks if you're just joining us we're talking to pastor david rosales from calvary chapel of chino valley and we'd love to hear from you some of you have commented already and, and we'd love to get questions from you as well as we're talking so feel free to type those in at any time but we were talking about you know because i could relate a lot to what you said and i think a lot of that has to do with perhaps the time we brought, we were brought up in. Uh, my dad was kind of emotionally distant. I knew he loved me, but it was emotionally distant. And just like you said, I don't think he hugged me until I was an adult, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that was a different thing. But one of the things I think I've noticed over the years is there's a genetic element. And then there's the, the environmental element, you know, that we, that we learn from our parents. And then, you know, because I think you probably can relate to this because you and I are, you're, we're pretty close in age. We're baby boomers, but uh, as you get older, you start seeing. Gosh, I, I see my dad <laughs> when I yeah, see that, or, you know. And so there's there's things that I think we can't get away from. But like you, hugging was a hard thing for me when I became a Christian because I didn't hug other guys. 
can mm -hmm. hug women, but you know, other guys, that was a hard thing. And so God does break you down. And, and as you said, you know, Jesus wept at the, at the uh, tomb of his friend and he held children and all the things that we were told back in the uh, 60s, uh, you know, in the baby in the baby boomer era is that men don't do those things, you know. That's right. That's and right. so that's what, one of the things that God that God does in us. David, transitioning from, well, I, I do want to talk about your um, your coming to Christ uh, because you had quite an experience. And how long were you doing drugs and, and alcohol? About five years, close to five years or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tell us about what happened that, that brought you to a place of faith. Well, you know, I had a uh, relationship with a young lady when I was... Uh, in my late teens and um you know i was never good at having having you know relationships with girls you know i was just incapable of emotionally investing in a relationship and so i had a young lady in high school that was somebody i cared a lot about but didn't work out for us and then i i met a young lady after high school and she became very important to me so much so that I actually believed that one day I would be married to her. And so my heart, I kind of entrusted to her and all, but it, that relationship just didn't work out and, and it bothered me a, a lot. So I, I started hiding in, in drugs, you know, and alcohol. I started abusing um, um, alcohol and drugs for over a, a month straight. I, was, I wasn't eating very much and, and I never was, a, I'm not a large person you know, but I lost 40 pounds, you know, because I didn't eat. And so I went down to 140 pounds or wow. so. And uh, so I was a skin, skin and bone. Yeah. So what happened is uh, one of my friends was starting to go to this church called Calvary Chapel. Yeah. There's only one Calvary Costa Mesa. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the little chapel there. Yeah. Um, and so uh, he he kept asking me to go, and, he, and I didn't want to. Being raised in the Catholic Church, I I really believed that I already was a Christian. So why sure. are you why are you bothering me? You know, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I finally, to get him off my back, I I, I smoked some pot, I drank some uh, some beer. I was barefoot. I was a hippie, you know. So mm -hmm. I went to I went to church, you know, with him expecting to be kicked out. You know, because at the Catholic Church, I went to St. Pius the Tenth Church in Santa Fe Springs. Yeah, I would have been booted right out of the church. I mean, you <laughs> yeah. can't walk in there barefooted, right. let sure. alone in the condition I was in. But there was a, a welcoming atmosphere, you know, and yes. it was all it was the hippie kids. You're right. This was in the summer of 1970. I was 19 years old. Wow. And so, uh, yeah, I walked in and I experienced something. I didn't know what it was that I was feeling, but it was different than anything I'd ever felt and especially different than anything I'd ever felt in my home church. And so uh, I remember a young man named Lonnie Frisbee. Sure. And Lonnie was giving the study that day, gave an invitation for people to be saved. But I believed I was a Christian already. And so I thought, no, nah, I'm not ready for this. And so I actually spiraled even worse uh, in my alcohol and drug abuse. And so, um, you know, a couple months later, now it was like in September, October or so of uh, 1970, I um, I drank um, almost a half gallon of wine by myself because I used to drink a lot. I was, you know, I, I drank yeah. a lot. So I drank almost a half gallon of wine and dropped, uh, I think it was five reds, which is second all, which yeah. is a, a barbiturate poisoning. I didn't realize I was I was killing myself and didn't know it. And so it's a depressant, right? A red was a depressant. Yeah. Yeah. We used it just, because we call them downers, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I, I climbed in the back of my, my car. I had a station wagon that I actually slept in when I couldn't drive and I almost died. I, I, I woke up and uh, I was about to vomit and I knew that barbiturate poisoning poisoning was you vomit and you'll die in suffocate in your own vomit. I knew that because I knew a guy who had done that. Jimi Hendrix yeah. had died. Yes. You know, these people that I, 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 I idolized had died in that way. I knew how they died and I almost died that way, Ron. And so I was laying in the back of my car and I was, I prayed and I hadn't prayed in since I can't remember when. And yeah. I said, God, please don't let me die. I'm too young. 
and I, I, I passed out. I woke up the next morning realizing that, that yeah, I made it, you know, yeah. and I didn't change. I, I, I got worse. I even started doing worse. And so I, I started stealing things and walking out of stores with my, my arms loaded with clothing, just daring them to arrest me. And I started living even crazier because, because I was so broken hearted and I just, I thought I might as well, who cares? You know, I got that point. Yeah. And so ultimately what happened is my friend once again invited me and this time to go to church at, uh, in Hollywood on December 27, 1970, there was a, uh, what they called a Maranatha concert. They used to have it at the Hollywood Palladium. You might yeah. remember that. And sure. And so I went and, and so they had all this music and messages and there was a, a man named Arthur Blessed who yeah. you know, carried the cross and all sure. of that. He yeah. used to hang himself on, on Hollywood uh, Boulevard, you know, yeah. and preach yeah. to people. Well, Arthur was the, the evangelist. And so I was there with the, about 4,000 kids and we all sat on a carpet and Arthur began to preach. And I already by that time had, had realized that I'm lost, but I prayed and I said to the Lord, I said, I, I really need you. I know I need you, um, but I, I feel, I feel odd. I, I don't belong here. I remember praying that and, and it's like the spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, why don't you belong here? You know, and here I am with all these kids sitting on the carpet and I'm praying yeah. and I say to this voice that's speaking to my heart, I'm, I'm not like these people. I'm not like them. And the voice came back and said, and what makes you different? Mm. And I responded to that voice and I said, I'm not a Christian. And that was the first time even to myself, I ever admitted I was not a Christian. It's the first time I had never, I would have argued with you hammer and tongue that I was a Christian yeah. because I was Catholic. I had been baptized, I've been confirmed and all of that. But bottom line is, you know, I didn't know the Lord. And so when that happened, um, my friend, we all stood up and you remember how we used to put our arms around each other and sing? Yes. Well, the song, Love, 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 Christians, yes. as you recall, begins to be sung. And I had my hands in my pockets and everybody around me was swaying, and, except for me. It's just me in <laughs> that area with my hands in my pockets because I didn't know the people who I was standing next to. Yeah. And my friend George turns to me and says, he actually calls me. He's behind me and he says, David. And I turn around and he and a girl named Lori, they, they were swaying. They parted and made room for me. And I put my arms around their shoulders. That was safe. I, you this, knew is them. The place, this is the place for me. This is wow. what I need. So when Arthur Blessed began to preach, he gave the invitation. And there were, like I said, 4,000 kids there. Wow. And he said, if he said, if you need Jesus Christ, stand to your feet. And I prayed and I said, God, I need you, but I am a shy man. I cannot stand in front of people. You know that. But if someone were to stand with me, I will stand. And Arthur blessed as God is my witness said, it, no sooner had those words been formed in my mind that he said, perhaps you're afraid to stand by yourself. If someone stood with you, would you stand? Wow. And my friend George tapped me on the shoulder and said, I will stand with you December 27th, 1970. And that's how I gave wow. my heart to Jesus. That's incredible. That's it incredible. is. What a <laughs> God knows our inner thoughts, doesn't he? And just Amen. put those words in, in Arthur's mouth to, to just Amen. help you make that step. Amen. What was your first feeling? Did you feel, did you feel anything different? Did you, um, did you feel a weight lifting off or, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I sensed, uh, I sensed the weight of the world literally yeah. rolling off my shoulders. I mean, I, I'd never felt that before. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that. Yeah. Definitely. And then, so this was in about 1970, 1970. Yeah. Oh, you said December 27, 1970. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that point, did you start attending a Calvary chapel or what? Yes. Yes. Well, what I did is, being a Catholic, well, there I am. I'm being I'm <laughs> being followed up on, and so the uh, the the guy doing the follow up says to me, you know, read your Bible, you know, and pray and have yeah. fellowship with friends. You know, the four basics that they gave us. Yeah. But you need to read your Bible. It's what he said, and so 
I, you know, I, I, the next week I went to church at the Catholic church. I brought a Bible with me cause I'm a Catholic, right? Sure. And I'm waiting to open the book up to, to get taught something. And, and they never did open it up. They no. didn't need to. And it was that day that I said to myself, I have to be in a place that will teach me how to live for God. So from that point on, I started attending Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, started going to the Bible studies because that's what I needed. And I had friends who uh, we would uh, fellowship at their house. And so we, uh, we would go to Costa Mesa. We would have an afterglow at the house that I was at. And I would go to the, my friend's house who were believers every day. I mean, every day we read the Bible, every day we talked about Jesus. But that only lasted three months because I got drafted. And yeah. I went into the army, and so I spent uh, 21 months active duty in in the military. Did you? Did you? Where were you stationed in uh, the military? I was uh, I was uh, with the 82nd uh, Airborne, and I was stationed in Fort Bragg in uh, North Carolina. Yeah, and so you were there for almost two years. Yeah, and then how did the military affect your faith? Did you, did you were you able to stay? strong in the faith during your military? Stint? You know, it was difficult at first. Uh, obviously, you know, yep. we are just started. The Jesus movement is just taken off. Right. So there aren't a whole lot of Jesus freaks in the military yet. Yep. And so I, uh, I ended up uh, not doing well for the first, uh, off and on for the first few months because I was alone. You know, it's the first time I'd ever been out of the house by myself, living somewhere else. And I had just turned uh, 20. And so I was lonely and on occasion, I, I went back to smoking dope. I didn't do it very often, maybe once or twice, three times mm -hmm. at the most. Yeah. But the conviction of the spirit broke my heart. And so I, I had a sergeant, uh, Sergeant Gomez, his name was. And Sergeant Gomez approaches me one day and he says, Rosales. I said, yeah. And he goes, he says, you're one of those Jesus people, right? And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right, Gomez. He says, hey, I got another one of you. I know his name is Rendon, Rendon. And I said, oh yeah? He goes, uh, let me introduce you to him. And so he brings a guy in named Danny Rendon. He's a Mexican guy, Rendon is his name, but Rendon yeah. we call him. Yeah. Anyway, he, he walks in and uh, we look at each other kind of that like, are you the real deal? That kind of look. <laughs> yeah. He asked a couple of questions. I asked him and yeah, we locked. And God provided this, this man, Danny, wow. who is a Christian longer than I. And Danny became, really an anchor to me. Wow. So he became one of my very dear friends. We began together to go to a group called the Navigators. You've probably yeah, heard sure. of the Navigators. Of course. The Navigators were there on the base at the fort. And so we ended up uh, just, I got involved with the Navigators for my time in the service. That really kept me, kept me, you know, centered. Yeah. yeah. And when I got out, well, you know, ain't nobody telling me what to do anymore. So <laughs> I, I, I went back to, and not, not fully, but, I started occasionally doing a little of the drinking and yeah. and eventually in Cinco de Mayo in 1972, Cinco de Mayo, I went to Mexico for two days and went on a terror. I mean, I was drunk with anything. you can. I drank tequila, you name it. We were, we wow. were drunk for two days in a row. And I got home on a, on a Sunday. I think it was a Sunday. And I, my sister Madeline says to me, do you have a good weekend? And I said, oh, I said, Madeline, and I started telling her what we did. And then I started to weep. But I said, I said, it was miserable. I said, I've gone back to the world. I can't do this anymore. I, I've got to get right with Jesus. And so we went to church together. And uh, uh, there was a, a minister who said, if you need to get right with God right now, stand to your feet. And I did. And I rededicated my life to the nice. Lord. And that was in May. Yeah. And then, you know, I, and I, I didn't go back to drinking. And in September, I, I uh, started going to Biola College. I, I signed up and went to, to Biola for a while. And as a Christian service assignment, I began to learn to teach the Bible. That's what I did in September of 1973. And I haven't stopped since. Did you feel a calling to teach when you went to Biola or did you just want to go get a Christian I had, education? I had a calling in my heart, Ron, from the day I got saved. Did you? I, mean, I sensed it. I knew that the thing I wanted to do the rest of my life was talk about the Lord. And uh, yeah, it was it was something in me that was so deep that I just knew it. That's what yep. I'm going to do for my life. And I've been right. doing it for, since ever since. You've been doing it faithfully ever since. 
Folks, we're talking to David, Pastor David Rosales from Calvary Chapel of Chino Valley and hearing his story. And some of you have uh, made some comments and look like we got a question or two. And we'll try to get some, to some of those a little bit later. And if you have a question, feel free to type it in. We'd love to, to hear from you and, uh, and, ask, and ask some questions of David. David, let's transition into ministry because you yeah, now you've you've you're out of the military. You've enrolled at Biola University, and you've got a, a firm calling that you feel on your life. What was the first thing that you started to do that was actually ministry oriented? The first thing that I did, you know, outside of the basic things that you you normally do as a new Christian or even growing Christian, meaning you share your faith and all, is the first thing I ever did as a Christian is I led my mom and dad to faith in Christ. Oh, wonderful. The first thing I was reading the book of Revelation. I'm a brand new Christian and I pick up, you know, we were taught, read the Bible. So I did. And even if you don't understand it, you're still being washed by the word. And so I began to read it. I got to chapter nine, that, that, that famous chapter with men with women's hair and iron teeth and scorpion mm -hmm. stings, all of that. Right. And I'm reading it and I'm three weeks old in Christ. And, and I take the Bible into the uh, into the kitchen where mom and dad were, and uh, I held the Bible in my hand, uh, and I, I I said, mom and dad, I say, remember, mom, dad, this is the word of God, and I said, hear what God says, and they got kind of they got quiet, you know, and really? so I read Revelation nine, and I said to them, I don't know what this means, you know, but I do know this, it's not talking to me, dad, it's talking to you. And I looked at my dad and my mom and I said to my dad, I said, dad, you're a good man. You're the best man I'll ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. Wow. I said, I love you, daddy. And I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head. You're receiving Christ right now. And my dad and my mom both bowed their heads and gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Here's a stoic man that you talked about earlier who didn't show emotion, but yet the word of God just penetrated his heart and uh, and God grabbed a hold of him. He certainly did. And uh, how long have are your folks still alive? No, my dad died uh, in 19. I'm sorry, in 20, 2001. Mama died in 2013. I, you know, obviously uh, my dad, my dad died of a heart attack. And so. Yeah. I went to the uh, hospital where he was, and uh, you know, here's a little silly story. But my dad taught me when I was a little boy because he was jealous of the fact that I loved Superman when I was a little boy. Really, my dad got jealous of him, and so my dad had told me when I was a few years old. He said, "You know, uh, he goes, you know, I am Superman." So <laughs> I believed that my father was Superman for a number of years. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I really did. I thought he was. I, 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 you know, I've told the church before. Yeah. I've said, you know, super bands from Krypton. He's a tall man. My dad's a short Mexican. How's that work? But you know, but yeah. So, so daddy was Superman, and so uh, dad had a heart attack. And here's a special thing about it: his faith that I, that I'm blessed by is when he had his heart attack. My, my mom called me and said, uh, "Son, your dad's had a heart attack, and you need to come to the hospital." And so I did, you know, I went to the hospital immediately, my wife and I, and, and uh, mama was waiting in that waiting room when I came in and, and she's just sitting there. This is a woman who had been with this man since she was a little girl. Wow. They got married when she was 17. Oh my. And so, wow. you know, they'd been together for 53 years, married yeah. for 53 years. And wow. so I went in and um, she says, your daddy had a heart attack and I'm the son listening. I said, yes, mama. And she says, you know what he did when he had his heart attack? And I said, no, what did he do? She said, he prayed. And I said, well, of course, mama. And I said, yes. She says, but no, son, do you know what he, do you know what he prayed? And I said, no, mommy, what? He, she said, Jesus, take care of my wife. My oh, dad, Wow. my dad, I'm sorry. That's okay. My dad, um, his last prayer was for my mom. Wow. Isn't that something? Oh, it, it, it tears me up to remember. But what a legacy, you know, what yes. a legacy. Yes. And so, uh, 
so yeah from from a man who didn't show any faith of any sort yeah a man who didn't show love that's how he died yeah that's something Mama died 12 years later uh -huh. and um you know mama loved the lord to the very end also that's wonderful they both got to see uh god's uh, work in you and his calling on your life and you being called into a ministry and and uh, establishing a church and that's wonderful that they that they were able to at least see that Amen. um that's a very touching story um so now you're at biola and you're in you're feeling this calling on your life and um talk about the transition into uh what led up to starting calvary chapel of chino valley because i know it wasn't originally there it was originally calvary chapel of ontario am i correct yeah, there yes yeah but what happened is um my wife and i um began attending um calvary chapel in downey oh, and sure. jeff johnson uh dedicated my my firstborn daughter oh is that right and so we uh, we began to attend there and then jeff had put on a um, kind of a minister's lecture series and uh, opened it up to the to the uh, people of the Cal Calvary Downey. So I went to it and I, I participated. I was already teaching Bible studies. I'd already been teaching home studies in in Norwalk as well as Ontario. Mm -hmm. I'd already been doing that, but I had uh, I wanted to get further involvement, and so uh, I went to Jeff's little little thing that he did. He had a number of men there, and so I that's how I got introduced in some of the principles of ministry right but because marie my wife is from chino and we were living in norwalk at the time i wanted her to be with her parents because it's important that she see mom and dad and so sure. we began to just take the trip from norwalk all the way to uh, to chino on sundays and so i wanted to have a um a church i could go to and then just go straight to uh, my in-laws and so we started going to a church in claremont called calvary chapel of claremont which at that time was pastored by a guy named marco alvarez and so i marie and i both started i i started going my wife and i and and i met marco i'd already spoken to him on the phone mm -hmm. i got to know him a bit he brought me into his a little council that he had there at the church small fellowship um eventually marco gave me ministry to do forum and so i got my my ministry feet in terms of the kind of like the the church type ministry you know because yeah. you can do your home bible studies but this yeah. was a different thing sure. this was actually a church related study mm -hmm. and so i i began to um you know do that and and from there um i i was ordained so i was ordained as a calvary chapel pastor in 1979 and so I went on staff as a uh, full-time staff member in 1980, and so remained on staff for several months until uh, I resigned my position and uh, began a study actually uh, in, uh, in Ontario. And um, I was asked by the members of that church, um, what are you gonna do? Because when you resign your position, wh what are you gonna do? What church are you gonna go to? Yeah. And so I said, uh, I don't have a fellowship to go to yet, but when I find one, I'll let you know. Well, what are you going to do until then? Well, my here's a little story, Ron, you might like. I, I just remembered. Um, I said, I'm going to meet at my sister-in-law, Patty's. Now, Patty, Patty, um, we had an outreach when I was in Claremont. I was mm -hmm. kind of the evangelist kind of thing we had, and we brought Odin out, sure. Odin Fong. Mm -hmm. And so Odin was Odin, Odin did the music, and I think I trained more follow-up counselors than showed up for for the country. <laughs> you know, it, it really wasn't right. the most yeah. effective outreach yeah. we'd ever done. Right. And so you know, I gave an invitation. Nobody came forward. So mm -hmm. you know how it is. I went into the back and I'm in the backstage area, and I'm thinking, well, Lord, seeds. You know, seeds were sown. Yeah. When my sister Patty, sister Al Patty, and her roommate Felicia came into the back, and Patty walks up to me and she says, "You know, nobody came forward." You know, I said, "Yeah, that's right." Rub it in, huh? <laughs> yeah, and I, I said, "Yeah, that's right, Patty." And she says, "Well, I guess I should get saved." 
And that's oh, how she got saved. Oh, wonderful. that's how she got saved. And oh, she gave gosh. her heart to the Lord. And after she did that, you know, she started coming to the church that I was pastoring. She and Felish. And eventually what happened is I resigned my position. And so people asked me at my Bible study that I was still holding after I'd resigned. What are you going to do on Sunday? I said, I'm looking for a church. Well, what are you going to do until you find one? I said, Patty asked me to come to her house and disciple her. I said, so for Patty's sake, I'm going to go to her house. And what, what lesson did God teach me from that? He taught me one person is important because in loving that one person, a church was, was birthed that we Isn't now that, pastor. Yeah. That's so true. That's so true. And that was the genesis of, of that yes. church. For one now it was and look at that look at the sanctuary that today god has blessed you with and uh church now uh was there was that a difficult transition from claremont uh in other words were did they bless you in your going in your leaving oh no they didn't <laughs> oh they didn't <laughs> no what well, it's a sad story but i'll tell it? it anyway okay um uh, the uh the former senior pastor resigned his position uh -huh. I was, uh, when ordained, I was 28. I became 29 just shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. The senior pastor was a young man at that time, of, I think 22 or 23. I had a lot of life experiences from my drug, alcohol, and military yeah. that this young man never had. Yeah. And so, you know, and I was married, I had children. So I had life experiences that he didn't have. And because he didn't have them, we didn't connect very well in ministry there were many things that I, as a young, immature man myself, began to see and didn't have the the quality of maturity yet to, to deal with them as I should have. And so they became irritations to me to see him making bad mistakes or, or doing things that were what children do and not what adults do. And, and that's a fact. That's how I felt. And and then he became resentful to me because um, of whatever his feelings towards me were. And so there was a resentment that began to develop between him and, and me to the point where he began to mock me and he would oh do my. so, he did it openly uh, in church and um, and began to berate me in, in uh, board meetings, which we had on a weekly basis. And that went on for, uh, for a while. And so one day I, um, I told my wife, I said, Marie, honey, I said, I'm, I've got to resign. I said, this is, this is not working. But Marie thought that I was uh, just running from problems. You know, no, you've got to yeah. stick it out, be a man. These are where my friends are. You know, you're asking us to uproot everything. And because I love my wife and I don't want her to not be cared for. Right. You know, I, I, I said, well, I'll just I'll just stay where I'm at. And, but he it, it kept going until finally I started coming home so, so beaten down. She said I came home like two weeks in a row just then I wept. I said, he's Marie. He is he's destroying me every meeting wow. he's, he's destroying me you're not a pastor you're you know he's destroying me he's mocking me he's mocking my my ministry my emotions everything and so finally one day the spirit spoke to her and said uh said you need to release him and just right around that time here's another one of those supernatural things right around that time my uh, I had a I was asleep and it was a Saturday night into a Sunday. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I I awakened in the middle of the night and there was a glow in the room. And uh, next to me were two figures who were standing on the next to the bed. Right. <laughs> and I'm looking at them and we had been praying as a, a group of men. God, show us yourself. Reveal yourself. You know, God, God. We want to know you. We had been praying sincerely. Again, I'm yes. I'm 30 years old at this time, but we're saying, right. God, reveal yourself to us. We want to know you. And there's these two figures next to me. And one of them, I look at them. I still remember this. I look at this figure and I say, who are you? And what are you doing in my room? You know, <laughs> and and they, yeah. they, they, the young, it had a male, it was a male figure. And he says, we have been sent from the throne to, to anoint you for the suffering that you will endure. And wow. I said, suffering? He said, yes. And he put his hand on my forehead and I felt a warmth just flow through my body wow. and they disappeared, right? So I wake my wife up 
I say, honey, angels were in the room just now. Angels were in the room. Yeah, and she yeah. says, yeah, right. Okay, baby. Go to sleep, <laughs> right? And, and I don't blame her. You know, sure. maybe yeah. it was a dream. I don't know. Here I yeah. am, right? So I, I I went back to sleep. I woke up and went to went to church. And we used to have a prayer meeting before service. And, I, and here we are. We are men who are saying, God, reveal yourself. We want to hear you. And I tell him, I said, I had the most remarkable thing happen last night. And then I tell these, uh, the senior pastor and two of the men, and I said, this happened. And they gave that little sidelong glance at one another, like this guy's nuts, you know, <laughs> and, 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 you know, understandably, but I thought we were praying that God would reveal himself. He yeah. did. Why are you treating me as if this is not the right thing? And so... Listen. And then so right after that is when he said to me, you know, David, he goes, you're not a pastor, but you are as a counselor. He said, so I'm removing your ordination. I am removing you from staff. I'm going to regard you as an elder. I'm going to make you our, our chief counselor. Uh, I'm, I'm severing your pay. I'm going to give to you only half of what you're making right now. Oh and, and he has this whole plan for my life. And I looked at him. And I smiled and I said, there's only one thing I've known all these years, and that is I'm a pastor. I said, but it's simply obvious that I'm not one here. I said, so I resign. And I resigned. I resigned my position that day. I said, I'll give you two weeks notice. I don't want to leave you holding the bag, but I'm giving you two weeks notice as of right now. And the board, uh, one of the members of the board got angry at me and started to berate me. And that's just the way it was. So I, I still remember, Ron, I, I walked outside. I had one, a friend of mine who was the only friend on the board that I had, and I wept in his arms. I mean, I, I actually literally just put my head on his shoulders and cried like a baby because I, I closed the door to my life, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I came home, and I told my wife. And so that's what led to they made an announcement at the church, you know, when I was no longer there, you know, that uh, David is no longer here. And that's what led to um, some people coming and saying, where are you going to be this Sunday? And I said, I'm going to be at uh, Patty's house. Uh, but if well, we're going to be there, I said, listen, I said, I don't want to be accused of robbing a, a church, stealing sheep. Yeah. I said, you know, this is not something I, I intend to do. You go and speak to the pastor. You let them know where your heart is. I don't want you coming to anything I'm doing. Um because it's not right for you to do that. I don't want that accusation of being a sheep stealing man. I said, I don't want to start a ministry like that. Uh, so I told him, before you come, you do that. Some did, others didn't. But the next week we had our first Bible study, July 26, 1981. And uh, I remember closing the study. Uh, it was Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. And behold, I will do a new thing. And so I said to, uh, those who were there in attendance that day, I said, we, um, well, if you want to be back here next week, we'll have a Bible study. That's how the church began. That's amazing. Now, is that individual who, who is nameless, uh, is he still in ministry? He is. As a matter of fact, he moved on with the vineyard ministry and is, he's, uh, he's, he's up in the upper echelons of their leadership. Because that's really where he should have been all along. Yeah, yeah. Well, you and I should talk sometime. We got some <laughs> similar backgrounds there. We could talk about. But, I think uh, so. <laughs> we'll move on. But um, <laughs> so you started this this Bible study, and uh, what uh, what what? Uh, how did that grow into Calvary Chapel of Ontario? Well, what we did is we started um, the Bible study in the home, mm -hmm. and we started with uh, about thirty adults and and less than ten children, yeah. much less than ten children. And so we were there in July 26. We stayed there till August, but but we outgrew it. You know, there were there were probably uh, growing to 30 or 40 in a small home. It was in a large home, and so we found a small uh, building that was a church building that sat 120, and uh, we asked if we could rent that and from them. They were a Seventh Day Church, and so they had Sundays available. So we moved in with about 60 in attendance in September of 1981. And we remained there. And here's another story for you, Ron. It's story time. 
And so <laughs> there we are in the church. And because we, uh, it was in October, we celebrated an alternative to Halloween. We made it like a little hallelujah party for the babies, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. They kicked us out of the church. They said we were Satan worshipers who oh were my. celebrating a satanic holiday when, in fact, we were calling it a, uh, a festival for the kids. You know, it was just for the babies that they, yeah. you know, it wasn't even, I don't even remember it being a costumed thing. We just had them yeah. there so they could do something. That was it. Well, they said, uh, you need to leave as of a particular date. I think it was like in, in, um, December, you have to be, no, no, it was in, in November, but it's a couple of months. And I said, okay, okay, we'll do what we have to do. And we started looking for a building we couldn't find one. And so, um, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. So I remember it was a, a Wednesday night and I went to the Wednesday night study. It was a home study. And, um, prior to going to that, I, I knelt in, in actually I lay face down in my bedroom. Everybody was gone for some reason, just me and the Lord. And I cried and I said, God, I said, um, we only have 60 people. I still remember saying that we only have 60 people, but they're the most precious people in my life. I said, if, if, if Greg Laurie were to lose 60 people in a moment, he wouldn't be able to notice he has so many, but Lord, these are the only ones I have. And I, I, I don't know what to do. And, and I, I got up, washed my face and went and taught a Bible study. I came home and I was laying in bed and about to sleep when I heard a voice in my heart once again. Actually, it was more of an audible voice than just an inner voice. He said, you will need a place to seat 200 on Easter Sunday. Oh, and, and I remember thinking, yeah, that makes sense. And so what happened was the next morning, uh, I was preparing John 12, 24, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Mm -hmm. And so I remember closing the Bible and I was preparing the setting. I was just reading and I closed it and I said, Father, I have died. I said, I, am, I have died, <laughs> you know, and I had written a week earlier to Pastor Chuck and I had said to Chuck, uh, I'd like to associate with Calvary Ministries. That's my heritage. And I've been ordained as a Calvary pastor. And so as I had said that, um, the mailman came up the steps and was dropping off the mail. And the, the voice came back and said, uh, your mail, your letter is here. Your letter is here. So I went and I took the mail out of the mailbox and there was a letter from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And I remember opening the other letters that were there, the other mail and the bills and everything. And I put this letter in, it says Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And I put it before me on the table I was seated at. And I prayed, I said, Father, you know my heart, I, I'm Calvary Chapel, but if you would not have me to be, then Father, whatever you want me to be is what I am. I opened it up, I still have the letter. It was from Chuck himself. And Chuck said, David, we welcome you to the Fellowship of Calvary Chapel. And so that week, that the next day, two days later, rather, I had a, a breakfast we did with the church. And I said, we're changing our name to Calvary Chapel, Ontario. And so we changed our name. And uh, from there, the church began to grow. I think Greg had even mentioned at that time that there's a Calvary in Ontario. You guys may want to go because some of the people came to our church because of Greg's uh, kind endorsement. Oh, wow. Nice. And then from there, um, we just kept on growing to where we're at now. And God uh, put that property um, into your lot, and uh, and you've just not looked back. And now today, you you pastor a church of what over seven, eight thousand people, millions 10, and millions, Ron. millions and millions. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, maybe that's how many come on a on a weekend. But yes, you you know, you're right just because it it gets multiplied out there. But yeah, you know, <laughs> yes, I don't know. Well. Yeah, but you you you've got a wonderful, and I know it's the church is not about the buildings, but God has blessed you with a wonderful. I, I walked around there um, when I went out and visited you earlier this year. That's right, yes. And uh, wonderful grounds there, and and folks, by the way, uh, uh, and David did not ask me to do this, but if you're in if you're in the Inland Empire and you're looking for a church. Calvary Chapel of Chino Valley. That's calvarychapelccv.org. They have services on Sunday morning at 8.30 and 10.45. If you've not heard Pastor David teach, wonderful man of God, 
teaches the Bible in a fundamental way in the sense that he's he expound, expounds upon the scriptures and um, just through the Bible, faithfully through the Bible. Uh, and uh, he's been a faithful man. And as I started out saying with this, uh, there's your YouTube channel, uh, right. Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. You could tune into that. Um, but there's there's some men because my my beginnings were at Calvary Chapel that I that I admire and respect. And, and you're looking at one here, David uh, Rosales, uh, who's been faithful, been a faithful man of God. Uh, I know he's probably uncomfortable with me saying this, but he mm -hmm. has been a faithful man. God has blessed him. God has given him visions. Um, and that's the faithfulness of God. And David, in our in our final moments here, there may be some people watching and people watching in the future who, who watch these after they've aired. Um, they're hurting. They're, they may be people that don't know Christ, who don't have a relationship with Christ. What would you tell them? I would say that the, the, the God that we worship, the God that we serve, is uh, uh, he said it of himself. He said, I am the one who heals the brokenhearted. He's the one who takes the uh, the captive and sets them free. He's the one who can uh, he, he he can heal you of your broken heart. He can heal you of of your sinful life. He can transform you uh, and does so. That that our God is alive and and our God is uh, is the God of life. Yeah. And so the Lord is 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 standing and and waiting for us to simply acknowledge. And to, and to say, God, please be merciful to me. I'm a sinner, and and it requires humility on the part of of a person to actually admit to even themselves that I'm not a good person. I, I you know, you you don't, you know, Ron, you don't even discover how evil you are until you get saved. That's Once right. you get saved, the grace of God begins to awaken you to how much you were forgiven of. So yes. often, when people get saved, they get saved for the superficial things that they're bothered by. And then over time, what happens is they realize they're a lot more rotten than they ever admitted even to themselves. Exactly. Right? Yes. And so it's through the reading of the word that you start identifying the things that this displeases God. Oh, I didn't know this displeased God. And you right. learn those things and you forsake those things. And so that multiplies the grace of God in you. And so I would say to anybody who needs the Lord to say, God, forgive me. I am a sinner. Uh, I, I, I ask you for your mercy. I know that you are capable of doing so and so lord i want to be new because jesus said uh, that he, he could make us new and the truth sets us free and paul said to us if any man is in christ he, he's a new creation old things are passed away behold all things are become new and i i'm a living testimony of and so are you Ron, yes. of, of, the, of the newness that god brings because of the grace of god and so i would say to anybody um, and I wish I had time to tell you of my story, the story of my sister who was a lesbian for 20 some years, came to faith in 1998 at an Easter service and how she met a man who had uh, spent time in prison for, for killing a man. And uh, this man who killed a man who killed his daughter is what happened. This man, he killed, he killed. This man's six year old daughter was shot to death by a motorcycle gangster. This man hunted that man down and shot and killed him and ended up spending time in prison for this man murdering his baby. He came out of prison. He, he went to the, he went to knock on the door of the house of a woman. That woman was my sister, a woman who was a, a lesbian and a man who killed a man. And I performed their wedding for them a few years ago because it's the grace of God and it's the word of God. It's the spirit of God that transforms lives. And so there's not a sin that anybody has committed that God is, is not capable of forgiving once turned away from. So I would tell anybody listening, give your heart to Jesus, turn from your sins. Amen. Wow, that's quite a story, David. Wow, that is, and you're right. God's redeeming love has no bounds Amen. and he will forgive anything that we do in every, wherever we are in our life. Folks, if, if you're watching tonight and God has spoken to your heart, let us know at Cal, at uh, uh, the upper uh, prayer at the Upper Room Presents. And the reason we'd like to know is we'd like to send you a Bible. We'd like to help you get started in your faith or reach out to David's church at, at Calvary Chapel of Chino Valley and let somebody know there that, that you've made a commitment to Christ uh, because you're looking at two men here who uh, were once sinners and uh, still are, 
but are saved by the grace of God. And God mm -hmm. has done miraculous things uh, in our lives. Not that we're so great, but God's, God's faithfulness, uh, even when we are yet faithless, he remains faithful. Mm -hmm. David, thank you so much for being with us. I, I love your story. And uh, you, you've got such a sweet spirit. My wife says, I, I love the way David teaches, and uh, he's just got a way of, about him. And um, that's, a, that's a gift. That's a, a blessing you, of God. Thank you so much. And uh, folks, thank you for watching. Thanks, David. Uh, and uh, tune in next week. I think next week we have uh, Pastor Barry Stagner will be with us of Calvary Chapel of Tustin. And, uh, and so... Great. Thanks, David. Uh, right, blessings brother. to you, brother. And you. oh, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're good there. So God bless you, folks. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Take care. All right, brother. Thank you.